decisive battles lay ahead of us. By the end of the summer, both sides need a decisive win. However, the clock is more pressing for Ukraine. Ukraine needs a big win and not just PR stunts. A real win to convince the West that helping Ukraine is not a lost cause. And for NATO to keep sending them heavy weapons and ammo. All the good stuff. And to achieve this objective, Ukraine has no other choice but to go on the offensive. And they have picked the southern front line as target. Apparently, the Ukrainian High Command has completed preparations for an offensive starting from Krivoyaryeh to push south towards Kherson. High-precision HIMARS MRLS systems have already targeted the very important Antonov Bridge. The structure has practically been knocked out, which further complicates the supply of Russian forces in that sector. On a side note, with this picture, you can clearly see how HIMARS rockets hit everything within a 20-meter radius. The Ukrainians also heavily bombed Nova Karovka, which is also another important cross point over the Dnieper. Even worse for Russia, pro Ukrainian citizens still in Kherson are transmitting data to the Ukrainian army about Russian positions and the routes of supply convoys. The offensive will be preceded by a massive artillery barrage from M777 howitzers at the positions of the Russian forces on the line of contact. And Ukrainian shelling has increased in the past 24 hours. These two examples show just how important Western supplies are to the Ukrainians. It's their lifeline. French newspaper Libération even said that Ukraine is out of ammo and now completely dependent on Western supplies. Pushing Russia out of Kherson would end any threat on the cities of Mykolaiv and Odessa and put Russian military installations on the Crimean Peninsula within reach of Ukrainian artillery. Hi and welcome to History Legends, here are the latest news about the Russo-Ukrainian war. Here we cut the BS and talk about what the media doesn't tell you. As always, information changes by the hour, so if you have any new info, just comment it below. If you're new to this channel, make sure to check out my Ukraine playlist so you don't miss anything I've said in the past. And some of my Ukraine videos have been targeted with limited or no ads, so make sure to support me on Patreon or PayPal to keep the show running. Thank you to all of you that have already helped, and I guess, welcome to the headquarters, training the new army. A foreign volunteer messaged me the other day and he explained to me what he witnessed in Ukraine. And of course, he wants to remain anonymous. He confirmed that Ukraine recruits were given three days of training before being sent to the front. A lot of this fast-paced training was reluctantly done by foreign instructors. However, most of them have since left Ukraine. Their personal belongings like passport, wallets kept vanishing and their pay magically disappeared as well. He said, I quote, Sadly, the only hope Ukraine has is the British troop training plan. Because without it, the Ukrainian army is not capable of winning this fight with or without Western weapons. And that explains why Britain stepped in. They decided to literally bring Ukrainian soldiers in the UK and train them there. So this sort of confirms the problems that the foreign volunteer was talking about. Problem is, the British military is planning to train 10,000 Ukrainian soldiers every four months. This is the amount of time needed to make them combat ready. Four months is great, but 10,000 soldiers is peanuts. Ukraine loses about 10,000 men every 10 days. By the time these British skills expertly trained Ukraine soldiers will reach the front, Ukraine might be at minus 120,000 casualties. I hope not, but this is the worst case scenario we have to think about. The worst is that it's specifically mentioned that the training will give volunteer recruits with little to no military experience the skills to be effective in frontline combat. I have a lot of mixed feelings about that. Instead of this, why aren't they training NCOs, officers, radio technicians, artillerymen, drone operators, logistics, I don't know, not just cannon fodder. On top of that, 140 New York Army National Guard soldiers left on a mission to Germany to help train an unknown amount of Ukraine military personnel. In the end, Ukraine hopes that by early September, an additional 30,000 troops are expected to be deployed, with four new brigades forming the core of this force. And for months, we're all expecting Ukraine to have this massive new model army being built at the rear, specifically meant for this huge counteroffensive. First thing that's weird is how come the media knows all about your future military operations. Come on, don't bullshit me. Are we witnessing another PR stunt? If so, I'm gonna be so mad. 
In all honesty, this could probably be a decoy to divert attention from the actual location of the counteroffensive, as Ukrainians could launch a limited offensive somewhere else, perhaps north of Kharkiv. And we know that every scrap of new Western equipment is immediately sent to the front just to pluck the gaps. So what is this reserve army training with? Broomsticks? Oh, my bad, that's for the Germans. Just look at the situation on the front line already. Well, yes, that is situation. Поясняйте, що так і так. Дуже важко утримати висоту. Дуже важко утримати висоту з тим, що ми маємо. Ми не маємо ніякого укріплення, де заховатися. У нас лише стрілецька зброя, яка постійно клине через те, що засипає просто землею. Починаєш працювати, автомат чистиш 5-7 разів. Тільки до обіда починаєш працювати, пісок край де куксується всередині клини. Зараз на даний час ми маємо на п'ятьох чоловік два автомати. If Ukraine soldiers on the front line have a hard time getting weapons, imagine the guys training at the rear. In the end, this foreign volunteer that has previous military experience said the biggest problem is the big disconnect between the Ukraine government and the military. Basically, the Ukraine government doesn't really control operations on the ground. In all honesty, it seems they don't really know what's going on. And this kind of coincides with reports saying how Ukraine commanders on every front more or less act independently. And there seems to be no big coordinated strategy at the moment, mostly piecemeal individual actions. Even worse, preemptive Russian artillery strikes don't allow Ukrainians to properly regroup to mount attacks, which forces Ukrainians to retreat to their starting positions. Ukraine's lifeline. We mentioned how Western support is the lifeline of the Ukrainian army. Fuel, ammo, T-72s from Poland, M-777s, German self-propelled artillery, British Spartan armored personnel carriers, a new batch of French Caesars more and more Western weapons pouring to replace Ukrainian losses, which have recently spiked after the Ukrainian army more or less abandoned all its heavy equipment in Lysychansk. We're talking about hundreds of tanks, armored vehicles and trucks. The HIMARS have proved deadly against Russian ammo storage in the first few days, but it seems the Russians have since adapted and they're actively hunting them. Now, I know it's controversial, but there is evidence of at least one of the HIMARS that got destroyed. And for this reason, Ukrainians have to constantly keep them on the move and spread them out all along the front line, which kind of reduces their overall effectiveness. But looking at how much effort the Russians put at eliminating these HIMARS just show how important they are. But thinking that HIMARS alone can win the war is also a stretch. After four months of fighting, Russia all but failed to stop the flow of Western ammo and heavy equipment from Western Ukraine to the front line. That is one of the biggest Russian military setbacks of the war. In my opinion, it became really costly for the Russians to use $6 million caliber missiles to destroy railroads or substations that could easily be repaired for a couple thousand dollars of material within a day. Same thing for the airfields, there's still Ukrainian aircraft in the air. Russians failed to stop activity on Ukrainian airfields. The Russians then started targeting ammo depots all over the country. But as you can imagine, there's simply so much ground to cover, and Ukrainians could also fool the Russians by setting up fake ammo depots and to waste these precious Russian missiles. And yet, despite all the Russian efforts, Western equipment still reaches the front. Now here's the million dollar question. Why haven't the Russians attempted to destroy the very important and strategic bridges over the Dnieper, especially the ones near Zaporozhye and Dnipro? That would put a real halt to Western weapon deliveries. And the Ukrainians clearly didn't flinch at the idea of destroying the Antonovsky Bridge. Why haven't the Russians done so? Interestingly, just recently, a Russian aircraft fired a KH-59 OVAD missile at a bridge south of Odessa, which allowed supplies from Romania to enter Ukraine. Is it because the Russians want to keep these bridges intact for future military operations? I don't think so, because whenever Ukrainians retreat from an area, they have this habit of blowing up all the bridges along their way. So if the Russians get close to the bridge, the Ukrainians will destroy it anyway. Perhaps they don't want to piss off Ukrainian civilians. I don't know, seems to me that Ukrainian civilians already hate them. Perhaps they can't actually destroy them. We saw how little damage caliber missiles caused to Soviet concrete infrastructure. Only a part of the bridge at Odessa was destroyed and it required multiple strikes. Same thing for the oil refinery at Kremenchuk that 
is still somehow working. Perhaps to destroy only one of the bridges, you would need something like 50 caliber missiles, without taking account those that would get intercepted by Ukrainian air defense. Interestingly enough, the problem could be coming directly from the West. Here from the Financial Times, military briefing. Is the West running out of ammunition to supply Ukraine? And related to that, perhaps the Russian objective is to attack the problem at the root, to create distrust between the West and Ukraine. And this could explain why there are so many rumors that the Russians got their hands on French Caesars and even the HIMAR. Allegedly, they bought one of the MRLS systems for $800,000 from a corrupt Ukraine commander. Just to let you know, one of the HIMARS costs about $400 million a piece. Imagine how pissed off the US might feel if it got sold for $1 million. It's as if you lend a brand new car to your younger brother and he ends up selling it for 50 bucks. Thing is, no pictures online can confirm that the Russians actually got their hands on this Western equipment. However, if it's true, this method would definitely be cheaper than any caliber missile strike and the impact would be far greater. Current Russian operations. All right, here's the moment that you were all waiting for. So this map here shows the alleged Russian concentration of forces in Ukraine as of June 26, 2022. But as you can see, most of the Russian forces are in Donbass. So let's take a closer look at what's going on there. Like I predicted in my previous video, it seems the Russians have picked option 3. An attack on both Siversk and Bakhmut, plus an attack in the center through Solidar. However, it was quite surprising that the Russians actually took a break. Probably for logistical reasons, but they still lost their momentum. And instead of preparing a withdrawal, this time allowed the Ukrainians to actually reinforce their positions, which you can see on DPA's map with all the little blue trucks. In other words, it's tough for the Russians. Not only are Ukrainian units making good use of terrain to build entrenchments and using forests as camouflage, but most fields and roads are heavily mined, which makes any quick advance almost suicidal. At Siversk, DPR officials claim they had captured this city. But like many of their statements, that proved to be an exaggeration. In all honesty, there's a lot of fog of war and there are a lot of conflicting reports. We're not even sure who controls the cities of Spirne, Vernokamienske, Serebrianka, or Hrirorivka. And to understand the situation at Siversk proper, we need to take a look at a topographic map. Essentially, Siversk is positioned in the valley, but Ukraine forces are firmly entrenched on the surrounding heights. That means that even if the Russians manage to get into the city, they will get fired at from every angle, with a clear line of sight. Whoever controls these heights controls Siversk. And for this reason, Russians are constantly shelling Ukraine positions into oblivion. And only once these positions are softened up, can they send their infantry forward. But even then, the process is very slow. Further south, at Soledar, Ukraine's hold very favorable defensive positions in the form of mines and quarries. Now, allegedly, soldiers of the 6th Cossack Regiment managed to reach the outskirts of the city, in the area of the Gypsum Quarry. Meanwhile, Ukraine sources have admitted that the Russians did make some progress and that they captured half of the city of Pokrovsk. According to the latest news, the Russians are in control of the southern part of Pokrovsk. Now, the reason why this urban settlement is important. Not only can this position support an assault on Solidar, but it also effectively opens the gate to Bakhmut. And from there, the Russian army could concentrate their forces and just storm the city. And if Bakhmut was to fall, it would prove disastrous for Ukraine positions in the sector. All these positions in the north, Siversk, Solidar, would fall on their own. And same thing for all the fortified positions in the south. And same thing for the defenders of the Volihryska power station. Ukrainians keep sending reinforcements in this sector to avoid this salient to close off. But if Bakhmut falls, holding this entire sector becomes irrelevant. Similar to what happened at Zolote, if you remember. I think at the moment it's a bit tough because Russians attack left and right to probe Ukraine positions. In turn, this makes Ukrainians panic and send the reserves left and right and spread out their forces. If the Russians find a weak spot, this is where they could break through. At the same time, if Ukrainians actually manage to hold on to this line, it would get really difficult for Russia. Now, of course, if we look at the big picture, the discussion of a massive Russian encirclement of Donbass comes back. In theory, the Russians could simply bypass Slavyansk and have all their forces from the Izium salient just push south towards Barvinkove and cut off this important supply road. This threat is real as it could cut off the entire rear of the Ukraine grouping. Problem is, I've been warning about such a move for at least 2-3 months. 
and since then Ukrainians properly reinforced this sector to avoid this from happening. And on top of that, the Russians would have to pierce through the forests, which have proved very difficult for the Russians to push through. Ukraine defenders can hide literally anywhere, and such mop-up operations require a lot of infantry, which the Russians don't have that much of. With that being said, I wanted to show you something that's happening further south. So to position yourself on the battlefield, here we talked about the siversk bakhmut line and then about a possible encirclement maneuver at Barvinkove. Now we're going to talk about Avdivka. I don't know why, but I feel that if the Russians end up pushing through this line and capturing this siversk solidar bakhmut line, instead of launching a head-on assault on Kramatorsk and Slavyansk, they could shift their Schwerpunkt an attempt to break through at Avdivka and New York. Yes, Ukraine's renamed one of the villages New York. Thing is, these positions are known to be impregnable, literally fortresses. For weeks, Donetsk militiamen have been inching their way towards the city, but often at a high cost because of the lack of armor support. We're talking about eight years of trench work, positions located on the high ground, multiple lines of defense, interconnected underground concrete bunkers, which makes them almost immune to Russian artillery. And there's the Avdivka coke plant. Yeah, not that type of coke, but raw coke. No, seriously, the unqualified term coke usually refers to the product derived from low ash and low sulfur bituminous coal, essentially a Soviet factory like a small Azovstal. So let's call this position Festung Avdi. And precisely because capturing this position seems impossible, an attack on this axis could be interesting and unexpected. Because if the Russians break through this area, it's just plain fields. No forest, barely any rivers, no urban settlements, nothing. And they could end up like a Popasna 2.0. Even worse, they could launch a DP attack on Kostyantinivka from the rear and from the front in Bakhmut. And if Konstantinivka falls, it's GG well played. It's essentially Ukraine's last line of defense in Donbass that collapses. The Russians could also roll over the entire south of Donetsk and threaten the logistical hub of Pokrovsk and create another salient the same way they did at Severodonetsk and Izichansk, from which Ukraine will have no other choice but to retreat. Okay, that part was map heavy. Anyway, let me know what you thought about my analysis in the comment section below. If you're new to this channel, make sure to like and subscribe. And if you want to support my work, make sure to check out my Patreon and PayPal. The links are in the description below.